All right, I think we'll get started since it's 6.30. I hope the people online are picking me up from Tyler's mic. So we have our Shoto County Ag agents, our only three-peat speaker so far. Um, he will be speaking on integrated pest management, specifically on grasshoppers. So hopefully we don't have near the WebEx troubles that we had last week. Otherwise I might cry, um, but I'll turn it over to Tyler. Okay, thank you, Adrian, and, and thank you for inviting me uh, to speak here uh, in Monterey County. Uh, we're gonna start off talking about some just basic integrated pest management, and then we're gonna move into a little monitoring activity that I have here, some of the tools that, that Adrian and I use uh, might, might be pretty handy for you to know how to use them as well. And then uh, we're gonna talk about integrated pest management, management of grasshoppers. So. So as you can see, here's a definition that I have. There's many definitions. It's a combined means, means. and it's not only uh, provide reducing pest damage for your economics of your farm and ranch, but there's also health, protecting your health and some environmental risks. And when we talk about environmental risks, uh, beneficials are very, very helpful, okay? Uh, especially in the non-boom years, okay? And preserving those, those uh, beneficial interests is very important um, <clears throat> in an integrated pest management program and when numbers are low, because they can keep up when your numbers are low. <clears throat> Here's our a combined means of, of integrated pest management. As you can see here, the chemical is on top. <clears throat> in an integrated pest management program, we want to have that on the bottom. We want to have that as a last resort, but often it's the only resort. And what we're going to find today talking about management of grasshoppers when they're booming is uh, chemical is really going to be your only productive uh, control method. Okay. So let's start off with chemical. It's not just a kill. Uh, we always want to kill things and, and kill it. Uh, chemical control can also be as you see down at the bottom, bottom, a growth regulator, and we're going to talk about a growth regulator that uh, works very well uh, in the early stars, in stars of grasshopper management uh, today. Of course, pesticide resistance, you know, integrated pest management was started because of the problems that resulted from DDT. Um, and I would call pesticide resistance the modern reason why we have to teach integrated pest management because, because um, if we're not using these, these other control methods, we can get into some, some pesticide resistance real quickly. Um, as you can see here, uh, what happens with, with pesticide resistance, uh, here's an example, uh, even on the fourth spray of the same insecticide from that same group, your, your percent mortality is dropping to 72%. So, so you're losing quite a significant amount by uh, utilizing that same insecticide. And here's just some ways that we can minimize resistance. Uh, you know, using the full rate is, is very important. Uh, you know, you, you can't cut costs by using the half rate. Um, it might work on some early instars of grasshoppers, but you get into herbicides, you do get in trouble uh, with your efficacy if, if you're going with half rate. There's other ways to cut costs in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a dry year. So, so uh, uh, avoid spraying every single year, okay? Uh, I, I attended a presentation in, in uh, Great Falls one year and he said, hey, throw an insecticide into your tank. You know, uh, it's a couple bucks an acre. It's cheap insurance. Well. This guy was from, from the Midwest and, you know, corn and soybean country, and that's what they did. But here in Montana, we do have an appreciation for our beneficial insects. And, and you know, visiting with a, the number of producers that I visited with, uh, they're really important to them. And we, we don't want to put it, put it in the tank mix every year, especially if we're not finding them. You know, so. Uh, regulatory is another uh, example. The, the closest I could find was a noxious weed seed free forage program. We don't really have quarantines here in Montana. Um, this, this, this program is where 
Adrian and I can get certified. We can go out to a, a, a hay field and expect it, inspect it for noxious weeds. Um, and we can certify it weed free hay and then that hay can be sold hopefully at a little bit of a premium and you can take it into the back country and, and public lands and hunting and that and, and not spread it everywhere. So, so uh, I guess that's the closest thing I can think of as far as board genes and regulatory here. Uh, cultural control, you can see there's, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of different ways uh, to do cultural control. We're gonna talk about some of those you know, uh, early seeding is, is an example of, of cultural control. Getting getting those spring plants ahead of the grasshoppers, you know, getting them more mature. Hopefully you'll miss that stage of life cycle where they'll move off to something green, you know, when I'm talking to you. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. So cultural control methods can be can be quite helpful. <clears throat> um, we've got some, and then we've got our biological agents, our beneficial insects. Uh, predators like your lady beetle and lace wings really work the aphids over. Your parasitoids are really helpful in, uh, with weed stem soft fly. And then your pathogens, that's going to be a really good thing uh, working with uh, trying to control grasshoppers as we get deeper into the presentation. And then mechanical control, you see there uh, leaving a third of the grain stubble. That, uh, that's an example of mechanical control because that's where the, the parasitoid of the wheat stem soft life stays, okay? And if you can leave a third of your stubble, you're gonna promote those, those wheat stem soft life parasitoids and you're gonna get more kills uh, on your wheat stem soft lights. <clears throat> so let's identify and understand the biology, uh, identification, uh, understanding the life cycle and know I know producers that I visit with, we don't need to learn how life cycle. We don't need to learn identification. We just want to know how to kill it. Just tell us how to kill it. And I'm sure a lot of you are on that page uh, because it's, it's part of your livelihood. But it's important to be able to identify uh, the insect. And Adrian is here in, in uh, Pondre. Everybody here is from Pondre County. Then in Teton. Or, uh, Teton. Okay, so we got a new agent, Karen. Fine uh, in your okay. You can take your samples uh, to Karen or to, uh, I think it's that me? Okay, you can take your samples to Karen or Adrian or myself. And, uh, and we're, we're talking about diseased samples, insect pest samples, weed samples, mushroom samples, um, gamut. And a lot of times the agent has seen it enough that they can identify it, but if they're uncomfortable identifying what they have, they'll send it down to Scudder Lab in Bozeman. And if you bring it on Friday and Adrian sends it in the mail, it's gonna dry up uh, over the weekend. Then they're gonna have to incubate it. Okay. Yeah, not incubate it, but uh, put it in a moisture, moisture uh, reservoir to help, help get things uh, moist and, and come back to so that they can uh, identify the disease or whatever it is, uh, the moisture chamber. Um, so if you bring your sample on Monday, you're gonna get a result back on Friday. If you bring it on Friday, you put it in an incubation chamber, it could be the next Friday or even later getting things going. So it's worth your time just to bring it on Monday and uh, and it's uh, because Adrian is going to be instructed to put it in the refrigerator. And I've seen a lot of plants drying out in the refrigerator. You've seen that too, I think, Adrian. They just, and, and, and the, res, the end result is they can't make a good disease diagnosis unless, unless it's sent down on Monday and then and it's, it's, it's fresh and, and able to get identified. Now, insects, they can be sent in the bio. That's not a problem. I'm talking mostly disease and uh, weed identification. So. Okay, uh, grasshopper life cycle. Uh, this is important uh, yes. for many reasons. Uh, and, you know, just understanding that these eggs are about the size of rice, you know, understanding that the prime time to spray with insecticide is that second, third, and fourth instar. 
you know, uh, understanding that the, the adults are hard to kill because they have wings and they can fly away. There's a lot of things understanding this life cycle, you know, that, that are beneficial to you understanding how to manage grasshoppers, understanding that they can only lay eggs as deep as their abdomen will go in the soil, you know. So, so <clears throat> the one we're going to be concerned about more, it mostly is the migratory grasshopper. It'll bury that those eggs about three quarters of an inch in the soil. So economic thresholds, this is where it's time to spray. Um, let's use an example of the pale western cutworm. Uh, we'll talk about that in our little activity here. Uh, two to three per linear foot. So once you get, if you have one per linear foot, you're in this uh, this safe zone. But uh, if you get two to three per linear foot, then you're going to have to go in, and uh, that's a good time to spray. Now up here, this is when the crop is destroyed and it's not working. Okay. There might be a scenario, though, where it might be. You know, the old timers talk about three year cycles, you know, and, and a drought can last three years. We might be going into a drought this year, and we might be wanting to plan for a drought for a couple of years, if you understand it. So, so if you do have a high a grasshopper infestation up in here, it might be a really good idea to spray preparing for next year. The problem is your neighbor has to help out too. <laughs> it has to be kind of a community effort to control these. So if, if you can, if you got a good relationship with your neighbor and, and you can work on that, that's a that's a really good thing. So IPM requires monitoring. We've got relative insect measuring estimates. Uh, that's where we're going to take a sweep map. And we're going to catch these grasshoppers and we're going to identify the, the age of them and the species. Okay. If you want to do a count, an accurate count, you need to go with an absolute uh, insect measuring estimate. And that's where you can, you can picture a, a, a three foot square, walk toward it, and count the little hoppers that jump out of that. And we'll talk about that a little bit here um, uh, in our monitoring activity. So you want to choose an IPM plan. Is it possible to eradicate a species? Okay, I got a no back there. The, the only times I've seen a pest eradicated, there was a, a, a yellow star thistle at Tiber Dam. It hadn't produced seed yet, and it was found and taken out, and there was a salt cedar along the Marias River that was taken out. They did a wet treatment on it and, and it actually eradicated from those areas. It's with, with insects and, and, uh, and weeds that get established, very difficult to eradicate. So you need to focus on these two, preventing genetic resistance and suppressing uh, pest populations. Okay, we're not going to eradicate. You can sure try. But uh, you need to understand that eradication is, is it's impossible once the, the pest is established. They can, they can get down in little areas and be protected from the insecticide. And, uh, you know, they've been around for a couple hundred thousand years and they know how to survive. So, so implement, implement and reassess the plan. It's a good idea to make annual notes and say you're spraying for grasshoppers. Not only to take those notes so that future generations can, can look at them and see what happened, because this grasshopper thing, it's a, it's a boom and bust species. It comes and then it goes, and then you forget about it. So you need to write things down, not only for future generations, but also for next year. You know? And I know it's ingrained in your brain when you, what, what you did last year. That, that's, that's pretty well ingrained, but it's still a good idea to write it down and keep an accurate uh, method of, of what you did right, what you did wrong, and uh, don't be afraid to share that with your family agent too, because they can spray, they can share that with other producers, and uh, that's, that's one one part of our job. So, so is there any questions on IPM? That was that was just quick down and dirty there. Um, 
So let's go ahead and everybody grab your, your IPM monitoring tools sheet. If you want to kind of come over here, I don't know what, I guess, I guess uh, I'd like to have some of this hands on. I'd like, I'd like some folks, maybe what we can do is, I'll call you. Well, how do you want to do this, Adrian? You want me to call a couple of people out of the crowd or you can kind of move around? Um, I guess. No, let's see. Everybody needs to. Oh, I guess. Uh, why don't we? Why don't we start off? And I'll just talk about this first part with the sweep map. Um, basically, you know what? Does anybody know how to run a sweep map? Anybody want to show us? I can't turn my back, so somebody wants to show me. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> anybody? You want to try? This is good okay. So, uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. So yeah, it's 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 slow motion. And it's 180 degrees. Okay. So your your things go one two. There's some there's some great um uh. Stuff on the uh, on the internet on YouTube as far as being prepared to do some speaking. You want to grab it really fast and have your zip lock bag here. And uh, I'll see how to make a mess. It's just a really good idea to, to do it this way. You're trying to you know determine what you got and uh, And it's probably a bigger bag than you have here, but it's kind of a shape of that there. Okay. Okay, then you've got it in there, and you've got it sealed off. And then you can kind of look at them under your bag here. Okay. And just look at identifying and doing your insert. I got some too old. Yeah, make a mess with the code. So uh, that's how that's how we do the sweep map. The other thing is with when you're you're doing the um, quantitative measurement, where you're trying to figure out how many per square yard. You guys. For farmers and ranchers, you have some of the best visual spatial skills that better than anybody. So I, I know uh, in this document, Judy Wargo, uh, she was the agent before me. Um, she talks about going with a square foot and counting what comes out of a square foot. But in my opinion, oh, these are the people square right there. So <laughs> I mean, there, there's your three foot by three foot, and you guys see. You know, you walk toward it and you're counting what's jumping out of that three foot, right? That, that one yard, that one yard square. So you're counting, you're counting, you've got your count. Now, one of the things that Judy Wargo points out in that yellow document is you need to get that low and look for your little instars to add them to your count. Because everything that jumps out. You know, won't be there, but you know, there might be some little stars. Maybe that's why she says we were put, but I, I think I think it's a lot easier to do. I mean, if you hit the, these thresholds we're going to talk about, it's not really a problem. So. Okay. okay, I'm not getting yeah. anything. We'll from talk about that. Um, and then and you're getting the grasshoppers. Okay, this is a no, I'm exercise. Cool. Uh, so I think it's a major like best thing to do. Everybody see that okay? All right. Thanks. So when you're testing for cutworms, what you need to do is they're, they're usually you're gonna have this bear ground where you're looking at this. And then you're going to, you have a tail west, and it's going to be cut off at the ground. 
if you have an army cutworm, you still need to cut off the fiber. So if it's nice for if it's nice soft soil, you just kind of go through with your fingers, then you rock underneath the soil. Oh, there's one right there. Okay, there's one. And then you just kind of working around and it's close to the green is where you're gonna you're gonna find those. Okay, there's another one. Okay, that's two, and that's within that's within six inches. So it's two straight to the middle of the feet. So so uh you can definitely uh that's a great way to check them and then use them if you're right in this area uh near where that green is taking them out. Okay. Did you see that okay? Now uh oh boy, oh we do for that one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, here's yeah. an example. Uh, you know, I don't know about uh, my great county, but we have concrete in Toto County. You guys probably have a little bit of that. So, so if your fingers can't get through, if you can have this this little three three tone break and then scratch it, and those those problems you can show up uh, in that area. Um, another thing that you can do is you can just go to digging, uh, you know, taking a couple of inches and dump, dumping it into the sand, kind of working your way down that way, shooting it out, and then you'll get nothing you can do in the landscape. But uh, definitely uh, a little bit of estimation for, for coverings as well. Okay, I guess I'll stay on this side. The next thing we're going to talk about. <clears throat> Uh, is pH meters. I don't know if you guys have noticed <clears throat> that the pH of your soil has, has come down significantly in the last 10 years, uh, especially with the show when we're getting a lot of crop on the crop. Um, what happens with the soil acidity is you have, uh, it comes from nitrogen based fertilizers, and there's hydrogens in those nitrogen based fertilizers. That are left over in the top of the soil, the hydrogen ions, and those create acidity, and that accumulates for a period of time. So, what you have is you get down the low pH, and that pH of the soil, and you have it basically kills you know, everything around it. What it does is it releases aluminum, which goes into the is absorbed by the guts and then it kills So uh, I got this as far as I'm monitoring because a lot of times you'll go up and this, this place, this field, and you'll say, oh, that's that's a bear patch. You know, that's, I know that's bear patch, but how do you know? Because sometimes these pHs can, can be a state, okay? So it's a good idea to have a pH meter. Um, the contact or shoulder county conservation district. I'll pass that around. Like getting um, a thing mine. <laughs> what we'll do is we we'll turn it on and last time I showered we'll pass that this one around because that was working. So, <laughs> so so you turn it on and you spray the end. And what you do you take your soil probe, which I have here, and you put this in the ground, and you're trying to get the top two yeah, inches to the top six inches. You want to try and measure that soil acidity. So what we'll do is we're spraying this two inches here and around six inches. And you want to kind of create your own slurry. You know, sometimes in the spring when you're doing this, you don't even have to. Okay. So I got it sprayed off. You're gonna go in at two inches. Yeah. I'm down my crawl space because I'm gonna get a frozen in the state. So I've got a good old 8.2 here. Uh, pH. That's a long time of soil, right? <laughs> so, uh, now take your bag. You wipe it off. Uh, distilled water, yep, distilled water in there, and then spray it off again, and then go down six inches, and your, your pH should be a little bit higher. Um, in this case, it's still a um, but uh, we've seen uh, numbers in Shoto County as low as 
four point five coming down close to four. So um, that's oh. one of those those words. It's a good thing. So what happens is when you get that close pH, it releases the aluminum uh, that is bound to the soil, and the aluminum goes in and is absorbed by the roots. Okay, and then that kills the plant. You have aluminum toxicity. I can't even hear it. Uh, the brochures, um, uh, a little blacker office that you can do. You know, if you're interested in that. Uh, situation because it's not just the show of them, numbers are coming down all over, you know, and it's a good idea to get out there and uh, test to make sure you don't fall below that six point one. Because once you start falling below that six point one, you get into that five point five. Your fertilizer is not even going to work. And then you put, you put more urea on, and that makes it worse. And it, it's just a vicious cycle. So, I mean, don't like that. So the only solution is bringing in new lime. So, so uh, and uh, it's free down at that building, so it's a cost you thirty dollars a ton. And you can put a couple ton on the field. So, I think what we're trying to do with this is you spread it on, and it's thirty five. You know, and uh, and it's thirty five dollars a ton. I do have one more. Okay, so so they they got them for they are selling them for half price. Yeah, and I believe so. It's I think it's like seventy five bucks. It usually costs one hundred and fifty. Um, if you guys just want to order one for yourselves, they're pretty reliable. You can write down. Wait, I guess they're constantly on so. You guys have that. Yeah. A um, couple more things. Uh, oh, here. Nothing worse with the soil probe than getting the soil out of it. This happened by accident. Uh, it just works so good, you know, pushing that soil out of there and uh, cleaning out your probe. Just a little, a little pin that I found in the back of my pickup board. It works. <laughs> <laughs> so uh there's that okay this and if you're seeing this is a I'm gonna switch to horticulture here if you're seeing the problem in the lawn where the lawn is dead from the sidewalk in and it keeps getting bigger and bigger you might have some drug problems so what you do is you go to where the you've got your dead area where the drugs have already taken out and then you've got your green area and what you do is you take your pocket knife and uh anyway um take your pocket knife and uh what you do is you cut a trap door now if you if you got bill bugs uh the grass will pull up from the crown if you've got grubs it's going to pull up from the roots okay so you can kind of tell the looseness that you might have them. So what you do is you just cut three sides, and then you pull your sod up, and then we got a horrible infestation there. So uh, definitely above thresholds, I think it's a couple per square foot. So uh, uh, on that, so so uh, a handy thing. Then this little little lady still gets so angry at you when you cut up their lawn. <laughs> you just put it right back. So, so uh, okay, a couple other things down here. Uh, this is a monitoring cutworm moss. I'm monitoring uh, these are army worms. A little plastic strip in the bottom is really good. Otherwise, the moths are going to beat each other to death. And when you go to do your counts, you're just going to have to help. Okay, so. Uh, these little pass strips, they're, they're easy to get, and uh, so I'm not going to touch it. But, but uh, anyway, we're pretty handy. Your little pheromones go in this little image right here. It's a male pheromone that, uh, so you can get a good count uh, on your lawn. So, all right, uh, orange wheat blossom image. I guess we can pass that down so you can't see that pass through. Uh, 
This is if you find nine, uh, when you're checking every other day, you go out in the middle of the night. Uh, this one was given to me by Daddy Gray, uh, which is a little more going on there. Uh, I can pass this around. These are orange people, lots of things. But if you have nine, you really need to go out at dusk. And one of the problems that you might have, I, a lot of producers have went out to count very five hits. I mean, if you count one, that's kind of a threshold. Um, I don't know exactly what the threshold is. But, so don't quote don't me on that one. But the problem is those those um orange by uh, those nucleus are orange, just like the sweet seal soft by parasite. So they're going down for the night, and your ages are coming up for the night. So you need to kind of know I didn't I didn't break some comparison to this, but quite a bit. Body, but, um, but anyway, you can see it. If you don't see any more things, it's just possible. I understand the stress. It's not going to be Also, uh, little hand lens, always handy to have. Uh, this is a nice bowl. Just the best way to, get, to use this one is you stick your eye right up against it. And you can't really see anything in this case, but you put your eye right up to it and you can see that. Uh, uh, and it's just learning how to use it. Um, a soil thermometer, we're going to talk about when the egg has to be placed, uh, and what temperature uh, the embryos get the grasshoppers. So, that soil thermometer is, is, uh, is a good thing. Uh, so you can monitor to the time of your spray, you can watch spray. And then James on your side, but uh, I've got a full brown curl. This is a, uh, uh, I believe they're still selling them after the uh, after the white Tennessee control. This is handy for a lot of things. I mean, I even did it for. Uh, Maybe the moisture and the water to get out from the water. But what happens is you can fall around so this you got this ball here and it just goes down to dry socks and dry soil. So you can determine how many branches of stored soil moisture you have. A lot of producers will use this not only for soil moisture monitoring, it's just in the fall, but also in the alfalfa fields. You know, you, you're walking around, you see this. Dried up area, you can go with your fall ground and find out okay, there's a lot more moisture here, there's a lot less here, so uh, it can be helpful there. So, um, and also for irrigators, uh, I don't know if you guys use these for irrigation and monitor stuff. Really handy, I think uh, it used to be 75 bucks, but I don't want to get in trouble with Jane, so it's around that area. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay, so that. That kind of covers the, the monitoring activity. Any questions on any of those? Any more questions? I want you guys to get your hands dirty, but this darn COVID year screwing everything up. So, <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> all right. So, <clears throat> We have some handouts that you were given. <clears throat> um, this just came out last week, and I've just made a few copies of it. You can get it online. It's available, or you can order it from NDSU. It's really nice uh, uh, opportunity to, to, to give you some really good information on insecticides and insect grass insect management. Now they also have a weed control guide that you can access and they also have a disease control guide. So you guys that are fighting Aspicida and want to rotate through different groups, there's a there's a, a disease control guide that can help you with that. And then with the grasshoppers, I've <clears throat> I've printed off some uh, all the different groups 
here uh, is on, on the first page. And then I've done it for alfalfa and for wheat. So uh, really, really helpful books and you can access them online. They come out uh, this time of the year, every year out of NDSU. Uh, there's, there's kind of a saying, you know, well, why isn't MSU doing this kind of stuff? And we, we kind of have an agreement. We do a lot of the wheat bleeding here at MSU and they take care of this herbicide thing. So, so it's, it's kind of a, a shared, shared deal there. Um, also this grasshopper biology and monitoring was developed by Judy Wargo. This is just kind of a kind of a relic I thought I'd give to you folks. Most everybody here is, is pretty young, so they I don't remember Judy Wargo. She was an entomologist. Um, the reason I printed it out is there's a lot of good uh, information about grasshopper behavior in here. Uh, really nice little document. If you'll notice on page five, it talks about uh, the spur throat grasshopper compared to the slant face. Your slant face is uh, typically does not, is not a pest. It really, really causes problems. So here's an example. The slant face and the spur throat, that's a, a, a two-striped grasshopper. They kind of faded in that. But you can see the difference there on page five that they, they have that slant face. Um, yeah. The hand lens, if you want to look at the spur throat, you can see the little spur on that, that two stripe if you look uh, pretty close. So, uh, now, if there are some contradictions with Judy's document and Kevin Warner's document, go with Kevin Warner's document. This is the new one. This has, uh, uh, you know, a, a more research background because it's been a couple decades since this one was developed. But there's some good stuff in here on grasshopper behavior and uh, uh, some good things on monitoring that Judy has, and I couldn't resist uh, printing it out and making it available for you guys. All right, so let's go ahead and, and uh, finish up here with, when we did our monitoring activity, and we're gonna move into integrated pest management of grasshoppers. Okay, so what happened and why am I concerned and why are a lot of entomologists concerned? I know some producers aren't, aren't worried about this, but, but uh, did you guys notice a lot of hoppers? Yes, in the fall. So we had a high egg lay uh, in the fall. This is what happened early on. We had a cool wet spring in 2019. It delayed the hatching. So they all hatched at the same time and they all survived. And there was so much vegetation around the state, especially sweet clover. I don't, I don't know if you guys remember a couple of years back, there was sweet clover everywhere and nobody really noticed. So the populations developed and we didn't even really realize it. And then last year they started, started moving in. So uh, then we had, didn't really cause any problems. I haven't heard much of, of a heading, de heading problems, but they were here and there was a big egg lay and uh, definitely something to be concerned about. So let's learn more about the, the pest. What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Yes. You said there's a big egg lay. What do we do now? Is there anything we can do to uh, mitigate that? Well, you know, they talk about. There, there's a couple of things, and the answer is, is not really. Uh, if you were to go out and kill it, it wouldn't be worth it. Uh, it would be worth it if you were controlling the green weeds. But if you want to expose those eggs um, and to, the, to these uh, colder conditions, there's still going to be a lot of survival, okay? Uh, and, and that kind of leads me to a question that was asked, and I'll pass this around. Well, this cold winter, that's going to kill a lot of hoppers. That's going to kill a lot of eggs, right? And I, it's like I said earlier, these, these animals have been around for 200,000 years, and they know how to survive. Now, granted, in Canada, it got down to 30, let's see, what was it? I believe it was 30 below 
there is a significant kill of grasshoppers. Um, but this study here, they did uh, a test on bare soil down at negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it only destroyed, and this is bare soil, it destroyed 85% of the eggs. Well, most of the eggs are laid in the grass, okay? They've got that insulation, okay? So, so your ones that are exposed, it's, it's, it's kind of a disappointing, you know, you hope that the winter's gonna take them out because we don't have snow cover. That snow cover, boy, it would protect everything, but, you know, but we don't. That's the other thing, that research study was done on a shallow laying species, you know, just like a quarter inch down. So if you expose those eggs, some of them are still gonna be buried and some of them are still gonna be uh, available. So any other questions? Yeah. So would you just plan on spring early then? Yeah, yep, yep. yep, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, seed treatment first. Uh, if if you're concerned, uh, I would definitely go to seed treatment. Then you don't have to time that spray, that spraying, and we'll talk about that here a little bit. Um, but that's that's going to be your first step uh, to uh, keep the numbers down. Uh, so weather conditions. Uh, this is ideal. It, this is what we need to hope for. We need to get a warm early spring followed by a hot period. We need to get them hatching early and get rocking and rolling. And then you want a minimum of one week of cloudy, wet weather, okay? Because that's gonna build up a fungus on those those instars, those early instars, and it's gonna cause them uh, uh, a lot of mortality. Now, so that's what we hope for, and then we'll see what happens. Uh, driving rains can drive them into the ground. They can wash them away. Uh, we can hope for that. And then cool summers and early falls. Uh, you know, sunlight is the mojo for grasshoppers. You know, it needs that sunlight. If it's not getting sunlight, it's not eating as efficiently. They're not. They're not. Uh, they're not feeding. They're not laying eggs. And your egg reduction goes way, way down. So these are these are the kind of conditions that we hope for. Okay. Uh, just a little general biology here. That's a it's a gradual change. So they'll they'll start out as an embryo, the egg will hatch, they'll turn into little tiny grasshoppers with no wings, and then they'll keep uh, shedding their skin, their exoskeleton, and getting bigger and bigger until their wings are fully formed and they're adults. One generation per year, thank goodness. Um, eggs are laid during the fall and over the winter. Uh, this is why a soil thermometer might be pretty helpful. Uh, after 50 to 55 degrees, your em embryos, your soil temperature reaches that, your embryos will start continuing with their development. Two weeks after that, that's when they're gonna start coming, okay? So good idea to know uh, when, you know, it's a kind of a general rule of thumb, uh, you know, there's degree days and all that type of thing, but we'll keep it simple here with, with, uh, with just 50 to 55 degrees. Uh, okay, and then they develop through five instars before becoming adults. Okay. And here's the life cycle again. Uh, you know, this takes 14 days. Uh, for that embryo, uh, for the egg to hatch after the, the te soil temperature, and then they're coming out. Uh, hatching can, can last six weeks, okay? So that, that really adds up. Uh, oops. Your instars, that's gonna take, it's an average of four to five days per instar. So every, and you're looking at about 25 to 30 days to get through these this immature stage. And then your adults can be around for 50 days. So um, 
definitely a, a long period of time with adults and then the instars they're just changing quite rapidly so they're when you want to manage from the second to the fourth instar here you've got kind of a narrow window to do it you know because they you know that's 12 days you know to get get things managed so so uh it can be uh quite timely and if you got a lot of acres you know it can be tough to hit it So a uh, little more identification uh, in that Kevin Warner uh, grasshopper is the white one here. He uh, talks about the three grasshoppers of, grasshoppers of concern. I guess mine is the migratory grasshopper. It's it's one that uh, that blew in. It travels long distances and uh, is is uh, I believe going to be the major problem uh, this year if the conditions uh, result. Here's your two stripe grasshopper. Uh, I've got that one that's passed around is, is there. Uh, here's another one that's bigger. Uh, so I'll go ahead. Also have a ooh, Mormon cricket here. Uh, and a few of these around in the Kings area. Uh, that Mormon cricket has a really long vocal posture on the end there. Uh, for egg laying, where the, the grasshopper does not. I think I got that one out of eastern Washington, but but we found some around the knees that are that big, so so uh, uh, pretty big. Uh, the two stripe has, of course, two stripes on the back. Okay, now just because you can in, in, you can identify a two stripe doesn't mean you can identify the end star because it's very different. It's green. There is two stripes on it, but uh, uh, which might be helpful, but identification isn't easy. And that's where we can help you uh, with the extension office, you know, unless, unless you get on your phone and you're sure, then you can move on. Here's your migratory grasshopper. Um, you guys have seen that one. This is the, the major one. They will destroy seedlings. They will feed way through the growing season into their adult period. And they are known for beheading the wheat as well. So, so uh, this is the one I'm most concerned about. It's the one uh, most prominently causing damage uh, in, in the Northwest Montana area. Uh, here's some examples of the stages. It's about the size of a grain of rice, this egg, and then how every four or five days they'll develop. Okay. These are very similar. If you you know, it, it looks to me like if you see these black spots on the rear legs, that there's a good chance there's they're migratory. And if you don't have that slant face, it might it might be a good little identifier for you. Uh, clear wing grasshopper is another concern. The, the largest wings, the rear wings, they are clear. So that's a good identifier, at least for the adults. Your immatures won't have wings. So, so uh, it can be a little bit difficult. Uh, fairly similar to the adult uh, as far as colors. So, so uh, and that's the nice thing about having your phones. If you do have a signal, you can get on some of these pictures or We'll take these handouts with you and you can kind of determine what you got. So our grasshoppers a threat. They're a boom and bust species. We have dry weather, high egg lay in the fall. So yes, let's move forward on that into monitoring. Uh, you want to get out there, you know, in May from May to June and monitor for these guys. Okay, it's uh, it's very important to get these guys when they're when they're small. You know, it's uh, they're a lot more vulnerable when they're small. Here's some uh, uh, information. This is a chart that I took from the Grasshoppers, page three. Uh, you can take a look at that. Uh, I just kind of split it in half so you can actually read it here on the on the slide. Uh, 
So if you get to these 30 grasshoppers in that square yard over there, you know, it depends on the prices and crop. If you got a crop out there, you know, it's you're probably going to hit it. You're probably going to say yes to this. Um, if there is no crop, then then you can move on. And then once it gets up to these numbers, you not only have to worry about monitoring and spraying, but you got to monitor for the next retreatment because it's just that they just get out of control. That's when they show up eating and paying off your houses and all that that type of thing. So. Uh, here's for the adults. It's going to be a lot lower numbers uh, in that square yard. As you can see, uh, if there's if there's a lot of those uh, migratory grasshoppers, there's a chance for head clipping. You know, if you've only got even three in in a square yard in the field, uh, good idea might be a good idea to hit it. Uh, this was at the end of Kevin Warner's uh, on that last page. It, from what I'm learning, and, I, I, and I'm learning with you guys on this, is that pulses are less preferred by grasshoppers and poles. And I was visiting with uh, uh, one of the guys down at Southern Bay Research Center. He said, yeah, the hoppers level the flax. The hoppers level the canola and the corn. But they didn't touch the chickpeas or the peas or the lentils. And uh, now that doesn't mean that you don't worry about it because you know grasshopper is going to go where there's green. Okay. In fact, they'll they love flowers and they love pods of lentils. And I I, I couldn't get a hold of the lady from NDSU, the the copy, the entomologist there. I was trying to find out if your chickpeas, you know, they've got pretty, some nice pubescence on them, and that might be kind of undesirable for those hoppers, but flowers are flowers. They get those flowers, and that's done. You know, it's, it's one of those deals. So um, as far as thresholds, uh, going back uh, to that, to the, this earlier slide, I've got all Montana spring crops and alfalfa. If you get this guide, the threshold is the same for spring wheat as it is for canola, as it is for uh, your pulses. So, so it's the same threshold. Okay. So implementation. Yes, chemical, cultural, in a boom, no, but maybe we'll be okay. Maybe some cultural will help uh, a lot. Biological, if we have a boom, it's uh, it's not going to help. Um, we'll see in water and GD war those that, that the biological, once you have those booms, they just can't keep up. If you can keep, you know, this is kind of, if you can have 20% infestation, like weed stem sawfly or, or, or grasshoppers, your beneficials can keep up pretty well. But uh, once it gets, up in the 60% infestation, you know, 40%, 60%. It's so hard for them to keep up, and it takes a few years for them to catch up. So. Uh, grasshoppers are nothing new. Here's kind of a little mini history of, of the, the insecticides that we have used in the past. Okay, so let's talk about Dimelin. Uh, this is the insect growth regulator that I was talking about. It interferes with the, the normal shedding of skin. Basically, it, it basically seals things off and they grow and they'll rupture or starve to death. So, so it's, a, it's really good. Uh, and it is quite excellent in an IPM program because it does protect a lot of beneficial insects that don't go through uh, shedding of their exoskeleton. There's a lot of like your adult honeybees, uh, they're they're not shedding an exoskeleton in their adults. However, they can bring dimelin back to the hive and spread it to the larva, which are shedding exoskeletons. So, so you want to be careful, and uh, you know when you're using these insecticides to try and try and protect your bee populations. 
and uh, and your larvae that are that are inside those beehives. So, okay. so yeah, it's uh, the second to fourth stage nymphs. Um, when the wings aren't fully formed, here's kind of a diagram, and I believe that's in Judy and, and Kevin's document. Uh, you know, the second to the fourth. So no wing there, just a little wing bud, and then you've got got that little flappable wing there uh, is the most critical time. Now, when you're doing your contact herbicides, and you've got that six week hatch time done, then you can go in. And spray right away, you know. But but uh, the dimelin, you want to you want to go with that second to fourth stage on the development. It doesn't work very quickly, okay. So if you're getting buried, you might be better to go in with contact herbicide, okay? Insecticide. I'm sorry. Uh, I asked. Uh, a couple of entomologists, how long given will last? Um, I got, I, I, I found uh, from one entomologist, he said 30 days. One entomologist said it lasts up to 50 days. But go with 30 to, to play it safe. You don't want to wait 50 days and go out there. And, and But that is the pre-harvest interval for them. So it tells you there is some toxicity there. Um, I, in fact, wheat, you cannot spray dimlin after the boot stage. That's just getting too close to harvest. So you can only spray it up to the boot stage. Uh, just just uh, some stuff that's, uh, you know, you're using your uh, pesticide uh, salesman can help you with one to two fluid ounces per acre. Uh, requires a lot of wire, uh, a lot of water. And as I said earlier, a knockdown insecticide may be really an option if, if things get really thick. Another option is a natural occurring pathogen. It's called the pseudomonas. Uh, you saw in that history of uh, insecticides and no low bait, that was, that was one of those. Um, the other the problem is, though, that it does take uh, extra time. Okay, so it's it's just like the dimelin. If you're getting buried with grasshoppers, you're going to have to go with contact insecticide. Um, there are some limitations with this nosema. Uh, it, of course, these are some some advantages, um, but uh, there are some disadvantages. At thirty to forty per square yard, there's not enough bait particles uh, to to uh, to uh, be consumed by the grasshoppers that are there. So, so uh, and not all grasshopper species eat, eat bait. Uh, research has shown you're going to get up to five to forty percent control in one year. But forty percent, you know, if you could get that knocked out, it, it might be. Good. So, so uh, I I do not know the price of Nolo bait or the availability of it. Uh, it sounds like sounds like it is available, but it sounds like it's pretty pricey. I know some 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 folks when I was at Asian in Tool County, they got together with a bunch of neighbors and sprayed a bunch of the bait and were really happy with the results. But uh, it was a it was a group effort, you know, a community effort. So let's talk a little bit about chemical control of winter wheat. There's there's the rats program on your grassy areas, border treatments, and seed treatments. So here's the RATS program. Uh, it's uh, basically treating in strips. So you can go through, you know, say with your dimelin and treat 100 feet and then skip 100 feet and your grasshoppers are going to go into those treated areas. Now I'm going to move forward a little bit here to the results of the RATS method. And you can see here. 85% uh, control using the rats doing the skip method compared to 85 with complete coverage. Okay, here's malathion, 85% control with the rats, you know, with half the coverage, you know, and and this is this is uh, full coverage. So it can be a really good economical way uh, to to help 
uh, control grasshoppers. Okay, so a chemical control border, this is uh, Kevin Wanner's recommendations on about 150 feet minimum, minimum beyond the edge of your, your cropland. Um, if the hoppers are really bad, you could go up to a quarter of a mile. So, you know, just to, to do these border treatments. So if they do come in from the neighbors, they'll get in and uh, they can get killed before they get to you. So. And here's the problem we were talking about uh, with your spraying too early. Either you might not have enough residual to kill the ones that hash later. Where if you spray too late, uh, the damage has already occurred. And the way that you can prevent that is with uh, a seed treatment. Um, you know, say, say a gaucho, there's seed treatments uh, in there for grasshoppers. Uh, you want to leave the center untreated and you can go with higher densities of, of your crop. You can, you can increase your seeding rate uh, to, to help minimize uh, damage. Um, and then with the seed treat, it does eliminate that timing issue. So you're going with your seed treat, you've got a little bit of time, then you can go in with your demo in it if you think it's going to work, um, or a contact spray. And then, you know, uh, your carburetor. You, you need to know how long that's going to last. So they will last 30 days. So it's a pretty good, pretty good long stretch uh, to help control the grasshoppers. Okay, and then we've got the contact insecticides. If you look in your North Dakota field crop insect management guide, we can turn to. Uh, oh, let's just go. For the heck of it, let's go into page 109. Insecticide registered for use in wheat. And here's your grasshoppers. Uh, so it looks like there are quite a few. The solid black dot uh, works pretty well. You got pretty good efficacy on those. Turn the page to 110, look down your grasshopper list here, and it looks like there's quite a few different uh, insecticides that you can use uh, that work. If you see a double T, that means suppression only. If you see a, a single cross, or no, single cross is suppression only, and your double T is control or first and second in the inside larva or control of young grasshoppers. So, so uh, a pretty handy little deal. You know, your, your chemical uh, rep is, is going to give you a recommendation. This is a good thing to, to look back on just to make sure it's what you want to do. And, and it's also good to compare uh, bouncing around from different insecticide groups. Okay, adults, they're going to require higher label rates. Um, not very effective if populations are high and multiple treatments may be required. So, so this is something I'm hoping we're not going to have to deal with. But uh, inevitably, if you're a farmer in Montana, you're going to have to deal with grasshoppers eventually. Uh, cultural controls, you guys do this every year. Keep your weeds down. Uh, a lot of you have grass borders uh, where broad leaf weeds might grow. And then your early seeding of spring crops, we talked about that. If you can go and get that, that spring crop mature earlier, you might avoid some head clipping. The grasshoppers might be at, at a different stage. So you, you might have be an advantage to get in there early if possible. Um, oats are less preferred. I mentioned that these are, are less preferred as well with the flowering issue. Well, you got to be on top of that because they will destroy those flowers. 
Uh, and the, here's the oh, biological control. Um, I just got a few examples of some beneficials that we'll see walking around. So, your bee flies, your blister beetles, and your ground beetles, they are all going to lay eggs beside the grasshopper eggs. Those eggs are going to hatch and then they're going to feed on those grasshoppers. Okay, so, so they are, they're very beneficial in non-boom years. <laughs> uh, let me preface it with that. So there's, you can see the bee fly, you guys have seen those, uh, the blister beetles. I didn't think a blister beetle did anything good, but uh, obviously they're, they're pretty handy for grasshoppers. And then your ground beetles. <clears throat> uh, the common field cricket. A lot of producers don't like crickets. Well, these guys do grasshoppers eggs out of the ground and consume them. So it can't be all bad. Here's a parasitoid, uh, which can egg, lay its egg in an egg and then hatch and then kill uh, the grasshopper embryo. And there's other forms of biological control. There's, there's spiders, uh, many flies, wasps, threadworms, fungi. Uh, birds can, can also keep up with pest, uh, grasshopper pest populations as long as they're not out of control. That's why it's kind of a boom and bust. These guys can keep them down for a lot of years. You know? And here's, here's what I hope is our silver bullet. This is the fungus that forms on the grasshopper if we get more than a week of wet, cool moisture. Um, they, they, the spores will germinate and penetrate that outside layer and then uh, it gets into the blood and the organs and can kill the grasshopper. So, so this, is, this is one of the reasons why grasshoppers are such a boom and bust species is because this particular uh, fungus can take it out uh, pretty quickly. And then just following up with, with reassessment and taking notes as we talked about earlier uh, on what kind of management you did and what you're looking at for the future. So, so that's it. Is there any questions? Is it like midnight? <laughs> How long did it drop? <laughs> yeah. Like this summer, our was we have a lot of grasshoppers and a lot of beetles and multiple oaks and spiders. It's really crazy. Yeah. It is like one of the one percent of the water thing. Or it is a long time in the future. It was a little grass versus a little rolling of water. Jeez. I, I got some pictures from North Aloma. They were taking beetles off of the beetles. And I don't know if they were eating them because all the needles were on the ground. Mm -hmm. I think they were just angry. But yeah, they were just <laughs> That's good. That's good. So that might that might be helpful to a point. <laughs> there, the grasshoppers are gonna be laying more eggs. Uh, so and your beetles. That do lay eggs, you know, they're they're only going to get a certain percentage mm -hmm. of of the eggs in each pod. So, what they can get, I think, the cumulative parasitism of of all the all the the insect beneficial insects and pathogens is about sixty percent. That's as good as you're going to get as far as control from the beneficial. And it sounds to me like. We're going to have 100% of the station this year. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But so as usual, the, the county agent always brings the bad news. I guess I'd like to give you guys some good news. Maybe we'll hope for those weather conditions and maybe we'll be okay. Yeah, so if we don't have the good weather conditions, we do, if we have a bad situation, we do suggest that we. 
spring demo early. You know, to around our field office or whatever. Right, right. So um so yeah, it only lasts about 30 days. Uh and you're supposed to apply it, you know, right when they're coming out, but I just don't want you to lose 10 days of the, that economics. I guess now that, I, I couldn't find out what the cost per acre was. I can, I can answer that a lot better, you know. But boy, once you see those end stars, and, and I hate to say it, but get above those threshold numbers, then you hit it, <laughs> but it might be too late. So getting in there early, you know, might be a, a better deal. But I mean, then. You're getting into the mud and, and it's tough to get in or it's it's fine. It's so wet. So but the seed treat will give you that cushion. Uh, and then when you can get in to the dim one, as soon as you can get in, of course I guess you got it seeded, so you already got in. But after you have that seed treat, I would I would have to talk. With another entomologist about that. If you have your seed treat, that lasts about 10 days. And your dimlin takes about 10 days for effectiveness. So right after seeding, going well, with the dimlin, I guess that makes sense if you if, if you think it's going to be a problem. Um, that might be a really good way to go. Yeah. If we do that, then we do a lot higher for the And I got close to that, like three and a half hours. Okay. I got to worry about the transmitter. You know, I was trying to research when these are most active. And I, I didn't get to it. Does anybody know when these are most active? Swim the way. I want to explain. I'm not really beekeeping. Right. Like, please spray it. Please spray it because they're most active during the heat of the day. I believe that's what it is. So, so yeah, you did some some big stuff. <laughs> so, uh, of course, then you're getting into efficacy and you know possibly some some other problems at night. But I mean that that might be a good way to go. That might, you know, well, you know, there has been, I don't know about insecticides, but I have read regular or herbicide efficacies. Um, and there's always a chance, a chance of, like I can't remember the weather pattern where it comes up and then it moves, it takes it with it, and then it comes down. It's a, it's a, uh, Inversion, temperature inversion. That's that's when you're going to get into some problems with with some inversions. You know, if there's no wind at all, you know. Uh, so so that's something to consider as well. Question online: Where do you get the moth trap pheromone? Um. So the moth trap pheromone. Uh, what we can do is is it is it weed head army worm or is it are they, are they looking at pale western cutworms? Okay, uh, we can get those, but we can have entomologists as far, as far as MSU get those for us. Um, and we can have those for producers if they're interested. Uh, and that the problem with the pale western and the army cutworm monitoring is I did it for years in school County, and well, I guess I was only up there five years, but. What I was noticing is we were getting high numbers in Tool County and Liberty County, and the damage was taking place in eastern Montana. So it's not necessarily representative of the populations in that area. Now, with this weed head army worm I'm working with across the IDK, I'm trying to determine how many I can, you know, what kind of the threshold is that I catch. I'm hoping I can correlate that to insect borders that we can find in these people in secondary schools. And those are those little green and brown worms you see you're harvesting. Uh, that's the, the harvest of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jim. Yeah. 
Okay. Was finding those kind of shock that the Right, right. Yeah, and I, I had Gaucho written down. So Gaucho is. Yeah, I guess I didn't have this. Yeah, and I think I think the people that use this gaucho for their hearing have Yeah, that's the point. That's not what you want to do the other one. So so that's gonna increase your efficacy, especially over that good deal of that in the end one of the item. That's that's the only control there. So yeah, so then then you're looking at Playing the time you insecticide, you know, and, and, and maybe not shooting for the grasshoppers, but you know, that's that's tough. That's a tough deal. Um, I'll talk to Janet, James, Janet Canola about that. Over you know, at NDSU, and maybe I'll re relay that to her agent and present to TV with that uh, um, to figure out what we came up with. This, yeah, you give up one yeah. <laughs> to, to the other. Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah. Yes. sure, sure. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? I'm gonna pass around two signage sheets if you have a test slide license. Put that number at the Department of Ice. Yeah, and if you don't, put them in the other. Okay. Are we Any more questions? <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. Yep.